You're watching WHO TV 13 Des Moines. Your 24-hour news source. This is News Center 13 at 10. Sometimes you don't get it just the way you want. And this is the time, that's such a time for me. And I expect it's such a time for everybody standing here. But it's... President Bush and congressional budget negotiators reach agreement on a new deficit reduction plan, which includes spending cuts and some new taxes. Good evening. They ran the clock almost all the way down. But in the end, White House and congressional budget negotiators delivered the goods, a five-year, $500 billion deficit reduction package. President Bush made the official announcement today in a Rose Garden ceremony. The deal includes a combination of spending cuts and revenue increases. More from Bob Franken. Now comes the hard part. Not that four months of bitter struggle to reach this budget agreement have been easy. But there are so many bitter pills to swallow that there is a real concern the highly political members of Congress from both parties just might not go along. The naysayers and nitpickers may have a field day. There's something for everyone not to like in this package. Taxes, mainly user taxes. An increase of five cents a gallon on gasoline, for instance, in the first year, five cents more the second. There's a new cigarette tax, eight cents a pack. Other taxes for beer, wine, and liquor. Luxury purchases will be taxed at 10 percent. There will be no capital gains tax cut, which the president and other Republicans so badly wanted. Instead, there will only be so-called growth incentives to invest in small business. Individuals or couples who earn more than $100,000 a year will get a cap on some of the deductions they can take, but not the higher rates that Democrats wanted. We all made compromise in the national interest. The package is riddled with painful cutbacks. So-called entitlements like student loans, farm programs, and mainly Medicare will be hit hard. Medicare will provide half of all savings and benefit programs through higher premiums and higher taxes on those in the upper income brackets. Domestic programs will only increase at the rate of inflation, an effect of freeze. Defense will be cut back $10 billion the first year, $170 billion through the five-year program. Altogether, the proposal calls for $40 billion worth of deficit reduction the first year, $500 billion over the entire five years. And already, members of Congress were squealing in pain. All agree that without heavy pressure from the president, the package stands little chance of acceptance. I will do everything I can. Uh, to generate support from the American people for this compromise. Bob Franken's Capitol Hill. Now, with word of the compromise plan, the House approved a stopgap spending bill this afternoon that will keep the government going until the new budget plan is approved by both the House and Senate. But as Franken said, approval is not expected to come easy. Governor Terry Branstad and Democratic challenger Don Avenson going head-to-head -head tonight in round two of the gubernatorial debates. And unlike the first debate, the two candidates really went after each other's political performances and their plans for the future of Iowa. Battle lines were immediately drawn between the two candidates for governor, with Terry Branstad defending his bid for another term, and Don Avenson saying if you can't accomplish what you need to in eight years, it can't be done. Then the question of abortion drew a clear distinction between the two. I will be the person that brings about a truce on this issue by saying to the General Assembly, don't even debate it. Don't spend your time on anything other than creating good jobs and a cleaner environment and a better education. Don't debate abortion. Because if you do, I'll veto the changes that come to us. Branstad says he'll stand behind current law, which says no funding abortions except in extreme situations. And how to spend money is another easy distinction between the candidates, with Avenson ridiculing uh, many of Branstad's vetoing decisions. We've tried to fund our mental health bill of rights, something that I helped pass a number of years ago. The governors veto those measures year after year after year. Well, Don Avenson is right about one thing. I'm the one that's balanced the budget year after year. We have to make difficult decisions. We on education, Avenson said he doesn't want to see so much money concentrated on teachers' salaries. Branstead took him to task. He's also the one that said, we have too many teachers in Iowa. We have too many schools. I don't believe that. I'm interested in making more opportunities for Iowa students. I'm proud of the fact that last year was the first time in 20 years we had an increase in school enrollment because Iowans are coming back. People see the quality of Iowa education. I want to make it a world-class education system. Now, the issue of crime showed another big split between the two, with Avenson blaming the governor for killers walking the street, and Branstad blaming Avenson and Democrats for dragging their feet on prison space proposals. If they agree on anything, it's that they agree to disagree.
Well, a stroke of luck this afternoon may have helped to avoid a tragedy on Des Moines' north side when a fire broke out in an apartment building. The residents were alerted by some people passing by. The upstairs apartment was in flames when people driving by the building on 7th Street stopped to warn residents. Officials say the blaze apparently started in the kitchen area. Residents say the person who used to live in that apartment had moved out just one hour earlier. Officials are investigating the possibility of arson. There are indications tonight that Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein is looking for a peaceful solution to the Persian Gulf crisis. In a broadcast on Iraqi television today, Hussein said for the first time that he no longer opposes the involvement of foreign countries in seeking a solution. His remarks come as world leaders at the United Nations shore up diplomatic efforts to drive him out of Kuwait. Two more American servicemen have died in the Saudi Arabian desert. The U.S. military command says two Air Force pilots were killed today when their F-15 fighter jets crashed during routine training exercises. The names of the pilots and the circumstances surrounding the crashes have not been released. The crisis in the Persian Gulf is taking its toll on many American families. For the relatives of Charles Keegan, it's been a nightmare. Keegan is the Des Moines man being held hostage in Iraq, and his family is trying to desperately to free him. Now, you can help by writing a letter to Saddam Hussein. Write to Free Keegan, care of WHO-TV, 1801 Grand. Our zip code here is 50309. We're asking Keegan's, for Keegan's release because of his medical condition. Now, as of last Friday, the family's letter campaign had collected 675 letters. We are two-thirds of the way to our 1,000-letter goal, and letters have been pouring in. We're hoping for at least, like I said, 1,000. Disease and malnutrition were the focus today at the World Summit on Children. More than 70 world leaders, including President Bush, met at the United Nations for talks on what claims to be the lives, what claims the lives of 40,000 infants and children every day. Now, they concluded the two-day summit by adopting a declaration pledging to fight hunger, disease, and illiteracy among children. Business and pleasure travelers can expect to pay more for plane tickets starting tomorrow. Most major airlines have announced another round of fare hikes that go into effect Monday. Rising fuel prices are blamed for the hikes, which range from 5 to 15 percent. And airline analysts say this probably isn't the last of the fare increases. A number of airlines say even with higher fares, they are still losing money because of increased fuel costs. The search continues tonight for victims of a plane crash near Sacramento, California. Authorities say the plane went down while performing acrobatic acrobatics during a, a pilot's convention in Lakeport, California. The plane plunged into a deep lake in front of hundreds of horrified spectators. So far, divers have recovered six bodies. It's believed a seventh person was on board the plane. So far, that person has not been recovered. Des Moines residents who want their garbage picked up this week will have to meet some new standards. We'll tell you about them next. And both sides of the sculpture art in Greenwood Park controversy racing for a big showdown tomorrow. These stories and more when we come back. Art in Greenwood Park. The big showdown is scheduled for tomorrow. Members of the Des Moines City Council are expected to decide whether to give the Art Center tentative approval for a controversial sculpture garden. New Center 13's Mary Mill says both sides are bracing for a battle. Each year, the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden draws thousands of visitors anxious to see the many pieces of outdoor art. The kids can be outdoors and enjoying some of the new sculptures are from the Walter Art Center and they, they always enjoy coming down here so this is just sort of a fun activity for everybody. The Des Moines Art Center has proposed a somewhat similar concept for Greenwood Park. It would like to place up to eight environmental works over a 27 acre area. Development director Penelope Hunt says the pieces would be site specific designed to fit in with their surroundings. All of these works would be designed to be walked into and on and around. It's work, it's a new development in contemporary art that involves work that can't be placed inside the typical four walls of a museum. So it's designed to be very interactive and public sensitive. Hunt says the sculpture park would be a unique attraction for Des Moines, a way to draw more people to Greenwood. But many nearby residents want no part of it. They like Greenwood just the way it is. It's not Tom Matthews is a member of Friends of Greenwood Park, a group formed in June to fight the Art Center's proposal. Matthews says the group has collected over 3,000 signatures from people opposed to the sculpture garden. He says it has nothing to do with the art itself. Rather, it's an issue of private control of public property. The Art Center, under the agreement, would have total control 
of large areas of land of up to several acres around each of the proposed environmental sculptures, and they would have ownership of the sculptures themselves. To us, this amounts to privatization of a city park and is against the public interest and a violation of the public trust. Both sides do agree on one thing. After seemingly endless delays, they'd like to see this issue resolved once and for all. At Greenwood Park, Mary Mills, New Center 13. Tomorrow's hearing will be held in the Des Moines City Council Chambers and gets underway at 4.30. Providing affordable low-income housing is the goal of the Anawan Housing Project, and today members of the Central Presbyterian Church got a before and after look at what can be accomplished with a little work. Now, this is the building that they want to renovate into low-income housing, and it looks like a big job, but church members walked through the place next door, which used to look just as bad, and now it has all the comforts of home. Of course, providing a home and care for people who can't afford it themselves costs money, so volunteers were out walking the pavement today to raise some money. It was Luther Care Service's annual Bridge the Gap Walkathon. They used the money to defray medical costs for caring for residents who can't pay themselves. Walkers also wanted to draw attention to the problems of caring for older Iowans. In Iowa, only about half the Medicaid nursing care costs are reimbursed by the government. Des Moines residents have some new restrictions to abide by concerning curbside pickup of their garbage, and those restrictions go into effect tomorrow. No longer will you be able to mix your household trash with your lawn clippings and yard debris. The new rules are four containers of household trash will be taken by city crews. They will haul away as many bags of yard debris as you care to send out, but your leaves and lawn clippings must be in those City of Des Moines biodegradable bags, or city crews won't take them. If you have any questions, you can get answers through the city's action center. There's a phone number, 283-4500. Well, Mike has mild weather back in, the, in our back-to-work forecast for the chance of rain later in the week. He's up next. With all the details, and someone in Wisconsin holding the only winning ticket in last night's Lotto America drawing. Here's a recap of that drawing with estimated jackpots for Wednesday. We'll be back. Family cats got to be in the spotlight today at the Village Veterinary Hospital's first annual charity cat fair. Now, the excitement of the competition was just overwhelming for some of the family felines. Now, you got to look at this. You can tell this cat has a hard life. There were lots of entries, but the blue ribbon today went to a cat named Lily. Congratulations. It's like, it's like a fat cat at my house. Got things pretty easy, too. Nice to have you back. How was your day off yesterday? Very nice, other than the weather. But Yeah, uh, we were joking I about it last it. night, so Rick? you picked the wrong day to take that. off. Mm -hmm. But tomorrow and Tuesday are going to be beautiful, too, and that's my normal weekend, so I'll enjoy it. I, it, always come, it always works out that way. Always. It does seem like it. But, uh, you know, the temperatures are cooling off this time of year. That means the colors are getting ready right. to change. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at where those colors are starting to uh, show themselves across the nation. We can see that really uh, it's just beginning now. The uh, beautiful colors are just beginning to the north of Iowa and also out to the west. Beautiful time of year right now out over the Rockies from Aspen up to Yellowstone and Glacier Park in Montana. Another uh, area for the beautiful viewing right now up around Duluth and Minnesota back into the Great Lakes region and also upper New England. You'll see these colors expand very nicely over the next couple of weeks as we continue to cool off and our days get shorter. And of course, here in the Midwest, we should be peaking in Iowa, especially in the Mississippi Valley, in about a couple of weeks. So some gorgeous viewing as long as we can keep things a little bit on the dry side. Generally, drier weather allows for a little bit better color. Well, temperatures around the state today were certainly fall-like, but still pretty mild with plenty of sunshine. Not bad at all. Readings just a bit below uh, normal for the most part. Readings in the mid to upper 60s and a few lower 70s in eastern Iowa. Temperatures 67 at Waterloo and Cedar Rapids. Upper 60s in the southeast. Western Isle saw some of the warmer readings up into the lower 70s at Sioux City and Omaha Council Bluffs here in central Iowa, both Ames and Des Moines sharing 68 degrees. Well, some Drake University students decided to head outdoors this afternoon. If you have to study, you might as well do it outside, I guess. Right now in Des Moines, we have mostly clear skies. We're at 54 degrees, 47 the dew point, 77%. The humidity south winds at 8 miles per hour. Those southerly winds will keep us up just a little bit with our temperatures tonight. And the pressure is holding steady now at 30.12 inches. The satellite photograph from around the Midwest, a couple of things here to watch. First of all, the frontal system that moved through the area Friday and Saturday, moving well to the south now with showers and thunderstorms there. And secondly, another weather system up to our north over Minnesota and the Dakotas. As we put this into motion, the clouds to the south move 
away. Meanwhile, the weather system to our north approaches, and a few showers have broken out this evening out uh, to the north over Minnesota, but it's a fairly weak system. It looks as though most of the clouds will move across northern and eastern Iowa as this weather system dives southeastward. Any rainfall will be widely scattered and a little more than sprinkles. In fact, we can see the showers now in central sections of Minnesota moving off to the east and southeast. More shower and thunderstorm activity well to the south, but much of the nation is dry this evening, as has been the pattern recently. The exception, the eastern seaboard, quite a bit of rainfall. New York picking up about a quarter of an inch of rain this evening. Now, the weather map by early tomorrow morning will show that weak frontal system right over the Midwest. Really not much weather associated with it. That moves off rather quickly to the east, so that by Tuesday, we get on the back side of this high pressure. Southerly winds develop, warmer temperatures in advance of... Yet another storm system moving into the Rockies. This looks to be a fairly strong weather system. It'll tap a little bit of Gulf moisture and should introduce some rainfall by the middle of the week. Now, the farmers would probably just as soon stay dry, but we have been in a dry pattern the last couple of months. Look at the rainfall. We went five straight months above normal from March all the way through July. Of course, a very wet summer, over five inches above normal in July, and then suddenly below normal for August in September, so we really could use some rainfall for the soil, perhaps, but I think the farmers would just as soon get out into the fields and do some work, so we'll try to keep it dry at least the next couple of days. Tonight, partly cloudy skies as winds become northerly toward morning, the low 47, just a chance of an isolated sprinkle. For your Monday, mostly sunny skies. North winds will pick up a little bit, but it'll be mild with a high of 70 degrees. Tomorrow night, clear skies, winds becoming light southerly, the low 45, so a little bit cool. And looking ahead then, through the rest of the week, a pretty good shot at some rain on Wednesday, but it looks to be a fast-moving weather system with not much cool air behind it, so temperatures will stay in the 70s pretty much. The lows in the 50s Tuesday looks like a high near 80 degrees, so sort of a typical fall-like forecast for this week. Well, you timed it good again. Not bad at all. I'm, I'm Can't anxious. complain about that either. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. The teams are set for the National League playoff series, and Toronto and the Red Sox will take it down to the wire. Pat has Major League Baseball highlights and a full recap of a wacky day in the NFL. Holiday sports coming up. Time for sports and baseball before football today as we get down to the wire, right? Yep. Yeah, that's right. Three games left. We know who the National League teams are. Still a, a battle in the East coming down between the Red Sox and Blue Jays. Boston. Won the first two games of the weekend series with Toronto and had a two-game lead in the AL East. The Blue Jays needing a win this afternoon to have a chance. With the game tied at four in the fifth, Junior Felix blasts a solo shot that just clears the green monster and left 5-4 Toronto. Later in the fifth, with the bases loaded, the Jays' Fred McGriff finds a hole as he singles to left. Two runs come in. Toronto goes on to a 10-5 victory. That cuts the Red Sox lead down to just one game with three to play. In Chicago, the White Sox played their last game at Kaminsky Park today against Seattle. Kaminsky is 80, year old, 80 years old and the White Sox went out with a win. With the game tied at one in the sixth, Dan Pasqua hits the ball to the left. It gets by Ken Griffey Sr. They scored as a triple. One run comes in. Chicago ends their state Kaminsky Park with a two to one win. Elsewhere, the Western Division champion A's top Texas 4-3. Baltimore and Cleveland split a doubleheader. Detroit blanked Minnesota. New York bombed Milwaukee 7-2. And Kansas City slipped past California 2-1. Meanwhile, in the National League, Pittsburgh needing a win to wrap up the Eastern Division, playing at St. Louis. The Pirates, Gary Reedus with the sack fly to center field. John Ca Ca uh, Cangelosi scores up as Pittsburgh opened up a 2-0 lead. Then with two outs in the ninth, Denny Walling grounds to Jose Lean. For the final out, Pittsburgh wins the National League East title with a two-zip win over St. Louis. Chicago came back to beat New York 6-5. San Diego shut out Cincinnati. Philadelphia topped Montreal. The Giants pounded the Dodgers 8-2, and Houston beat Atlanta 6-2. Now to football in week four of the NFL. It turned out to be a day of close games and a couple of upsets. We begin in L.A. with a battle between a pair of unbeaten teams, the Bears and the Raiders, with Los Angeles leading 7-0 in the first quarter. Jim Harbaugh hits Dennis Gentry. He goes all the way 80 yards, and the game was tied at 7. The Raiders' defense would get their revenge in the second quarter. Aaron Williams will sack Harbaugh. As he goes down, the ball comes loose. Greg Townsend recovers it in the end zone for the touchdown. The Raiders win it 24-10. They're now 4-0. The Bears suffer their first loss. To Minneapolis, the Vikings hosting the Buccaneers. Minnesota trailed most of the game but took the lead in the fourth quarter on this 41-yard scoring strike from Rich Gannon to Hassan Jones. 2013 Vikings with two minutes to play. 
but Vinny Testaverde brought Tampa back. He scrambles and hits Bruce Hill all alone in the end zone, an 11-yard TD, and the game went into overtime tied at 20. Minnesota with the ball. Gannon throws over the middle to Anthony Carter. He bobbles it and can't hold on. Wayne Maddox does. That gave the Bucks great field position. And then in steps Steve Christie. He drills the 36-yard field goal, and Tampa Bay pulls the upset in overtime, 23-20. Next to Detroit, the Lions and the Packers. Detroit in control. Rodney Pete with all kinds of time. He decides to roll right, and he takes it in seven yards for a 21-10 third quarter lead for Detroit. Then the Magic Man rallied the Packers. Don Mikowski will step up and hit Jeff Corey crossing in the back of the end zone. Green Bay takes the lead 24-21, but the Lions had one last chance. Eddie Murray with a 44-yard field goal. He misses it, and Green Bay escapes with a 24-21 victory. In Buffalo, the Bills with the comeback of the year against the Broncos. Denver led 21-9 in the third quarter. David Treadwell was trying to extend it, but his field goal try is blocked. Cornelius Bennett scoops up the ball. He could go all the way. 80 yards for the score, 21-16. On the Broncos' next possession, John Elway is intercepted by Leonard Smith. He weaves his way 39 yards into the end zone. The Bills take the lead, 22-21. Denver gets the ball back, and Elway fumbles the snap. Cornelius Bennett recovers it at the three. Buffalo scores on the next play as the Bills shock the Broncos 29-28. And finally in Kansas City, the Chiefs manhandled the Browns. Steve DeBerg airs it out and hits a wide-open Rob Thomas for a 58-yard touchdown. Kansas City also scored two TDs on blocked punts. The Chiefs moved to 3-1 on the season with a 34-0 victory. Also this afternoon, the Giants down Dallas 31-17. Indianapolis with the upset over Philadelphia 24-23. Miami bombed Pittsburgh 28-6. Houston beat San Diego 17-7. The New York Jets were easy winners over New England 37-13. And tonight, Washington pounded Phoenix 38-10. Coming up next is Sports Sunday. We'll give you a chance to pick next week's NFL game you'll see here on TV 13. We'll also show you the finals of the Midwest Pro Bowlers Open played here in Des Moines this weekend. That and more next. Welcome to Sports Sunday. The finals for the Midwest region of the Pro Bowlers Association were held this afternoon at Fairlanes here in Des Moines. In the championship, it was a battle of two Wisconsiners. Mark McDowell of Madison with the strike here to put pressure on the top seed, Dale Traber. But Traber would respond with a strike of his own. Dale Traber goes on to win the title with a 236. McDowell bowled a 227. Traber takes home the $2,800 first place prize. The Iowa State Cyclones got a much-needed win yesterday over Western Michigan. ISU won the game 34-20. Coach Jim Walden, though, was upset at his players because of their lackluster play. But the Cyclones may get quarterback Chris Peterson back for next week's game against Kansas. Wasn't real pretty, I don't think. I wasn't too keen on it. I guess you'd say we kind of halfway took a day off and had enough ability to win the game. And that's about it. You know, if Chris is healthy to play, you know, I think he had to start personally. He's our best quarterback here, and I think he had to play. And, uh, you know, if he's not, then uh, I want to do the best job I can and get another win in the video conference. Now it's time once again for you to pick which NFL game we show next week here on TV 13. To vote, call our city source number at 246-5600 and press category 1314. Then if you'd like to see the Kansas City Chiefs face the Indianapolis Colts, press 1. If you'd rather see the Miami Dolphins host the New York Jets, press 2. Again, for the Chiefs-Colts game, press 1. For the Jets-Dolphins game, press 2. Lines will be open until Tuesday night. And uh, Scott, sorry about the way the Broncos finished the second half today. Well, how many more weeks we got? 12? Uh, yeah, something like that. Plenty of time. That's right. Thanks, Pat. Art in Greenwood Park at the new location for the Northwest Pool are two stories coming up in the week ahead. Monday afternoon, Des Moines City officials will hear final arguments for and against putting art sculptures in Greenwood Park. That meeting starts at 4.30 in City Council Chambers. And on Tuesday, City Council will hold a public Sorry. hearing concerning the new site for Northwest Pool. That's just one of the things residents voted for when they passed the bond issue in August. You can look for these stories and more in the week ahead. Big news day ahead tomorrow, but a great day to do absolutely nothing if you uh, have that on your schedule. That's right. It looks like a fine Monday to go outdoors, play golf, or just about anything else. Let's take a look at your wake-up weather for tomorrow morning. Partly cloudy skies. 48 degrees will have a high near 70 with north winds a little bit breezy by afternoon.
All right, thanks, Mike. Finally, tonight, car buffs had the chance to view dozens of classics at the Des Moines Convention Center this weekend, and at the same time, help Central Iowa's needy. Vets Cadillac put 40 classic Cadillacs on display to the public. Admission to the show was a non-perishable food item. The Caddies dated back all the way to 1947 and included some very rare models, like this 1959 Eldorado Brome. Only 99 of these were ever built. Over 1,200 people attended the show. All of the food will help stock the shelves at the Des Moines Area Food Pantry and the Food Bank of Isle. Wouldn't that be nice? Nice car, too. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us. Have a good week. We'll see you next Saturday. Good night. For around-the-clock news headlines in the Des Moines area, watch News Center 13 on Heritage Cable Channel 24 twice each hour.